welcome everybody to the 2024 Nemers Prize Lecture. The Mechthild Emmers Esser Nemers Prize in Medical Science is awarded to a physician scientist whose body of research demonstrates works of long-lasting significance in the field of medical science. This biennial prize is only one of five Nemers Prizes that Northwestern administers. The prize has been awarded since 2016. Previous recipients have included Hoda Zogby, who was the inaugural prize winner, known for her groundbreaking research in Rett's uh, syndrome and other neurological diseases. Dr. Stuart Orkin, recognized for his research into blood cell development and the genetic basis of blood disorders. And Jeremy Nathan, known for his landmark discoveries into the molecular mechanisms of the visual system, development, function, and disease. So this year's award winner is Dr. Jeffrey Gordon. He is a distinguished university professor at Washington University in St. Louis and is often referred to as the father of microbiome research. Gordon received his medical degree from the University of Chicago, completing his residency at Barnes Jewish Hospital and served some time as a research associate in the Laboratory of Biochemistry at the NCI. He has spent his entire academic career at Washington University, first as a member of the Departments of Medicine and Biological Chemistry, then as head of the Department of Molecular Biology and Pharmacology. And since 2004, he has been the founding director of the university's interdepartmental Edison Family Center for Genome Sciences and Systems Biology. By utilizing interdisciplinary approaches for understanding how the gut microbiome contributes to health and disease, Gordon's research has founded a widely used paradigm for establishment of causal relationships between the microbiome, structure, function, and status of health. Also how to identify therapeutic targets in the microbiome and for developing ways to alter the microbiome. Gordon's groundbreaking research on childhood undernutrition led to the discovery of age discriminatory bacteria whose changes in representation in healthy infants and children define a shared normal gut microbiota development taking place largely in the first two years of life. By transplanting microbiota from these children and their healthy counterparts into germ-free mice, Gordon identified bacterial strains that promote lean body mass gain and affect bone development, metabolism, and immune function. Gordon then developed microbiota-directed complementary food prototypes designed to introduce critical bacterial strains into Bangladeshi children who lack them. Today, Dr. Gordon will discuss developing microbiome-targeted therapeutics for childhood undernutrition. A member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine since 2008, Gordon's work has been recognized with numerous prizes and awards, including the David and Beatrix Hamburg Award for Advances in Biomedical Research and Clinical Medicine from the National Academy of Medicine, and the Albany Medical Center Prize in Medicine and Biomedical Research. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Warden, Gordon as the 2024 Nemers Prize winner. And Dr. Gordon, it's my pleasure to invite you to the podium for your Nemers Prize lecture. I really appreciate this great honor, and I'm humbled to be uh, its recipient. I want to spend just a few minutes uh, uh, reading from some notes to thank some people that have made uh, today possible, and then I'll go through the lecture. Um, uh, curiosity and deep commitment to learning and a willingness to explore the unknown are paramount to advancing science and society. The importance of an interdisciplinary community in addressing compelling scientific questions cannot be understated. It takes many talented, inquisitive individuals to advance knowledge. I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with many such talented students, postdoctoral fellows, staff, and collaborators, and I accept this award on their behalf. They have had a shared belief that the discoveries and innovation um, that are possible in this area and other areas are born from a caring, supportive, respectful, diverse, and trusting collaborative environment where we can freely share 
ideas with one another, and at the same time, not be afraid to say, I, don't, I do not understand, so that we can learn together. In many ways, the type of environment they created and perpetuated and their support of one another illustrate the foundations of human flourishing. Hope, trust, humility, empathy, kindness, generosity, gratitude, a shared sense of purpose, and a shared joy. How we, as a lab, traveled to the present moment was in so many respects unanticipated. Their journey was full of unexpected events, observations, and interactions. It reflected finding the right partners environment and support systems to first define and then pursue in a sustained manner the questions that we were finding to be so alluring and so daunting. The journey required the gift of attention, a gift that we can only and ultimately give ourselves, a gift that, allow us, that allowed us to see and understand the significance of what lay in front of us. Over the years, I've had the privilege of working with fantastic collaborators. These collaborators um, related to the microbiome began with the late Abigail Sayers at the University of Illinois and Turi Metbet from the Karolinska Institute. My major collaborator, Tamid Ahmed, the executive director of the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh, and his colleagues have dedicated their lives to understanding the origins and developing new ways to treat and ultimately prevent undernutrition in infants, in children, and in mothers. The dynamism of microbial communities, their adaptability, the breadth of functions encoded in the microbiome that we've not had to acquire in our human genome, the seemingly astronomical number of potential interactions between community members and their human hosts make the journey exploring this terra incognita inspiring and humbling. The public is becoming increasingly aware of the microbiome. As such, there's a need to approach bench to bedside translation of discoveries mindfully and to engage in a proactive societal dialogue about the ethical, about the legal, social, safety, and regulatory issues raised by this research. We're seeing the microbiome um, as a way of expanding our understanding of the human condition since in so many respects, the microbiome reflects the very ways that we live, the very unsettling gradients in wealth um, and access to resources that currently exist, the health disparities that we must acknowledge, address, surmount, as well as the existential threat posed by climate change. Although I'm older, I feel very young. We've learned a great deal along the way in this journey what remains to be discovered keeps me feeling very young. I truly believe that all the work that we have done makes it possible to begin to do the things we've always dreamed of doing. The best part of the journey is now and will be tomorrow. So thank you. So this is our team, a group of individuals um, in the laboratory at Washington University School of Medicine and a group at ICDDRB led by Tamid Ahmed. This is a journey that's largely funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's designed to address a global health challenge that's pressing, that's vexing, and in many ways tragic. The leading cause of death in children under five worldwide. A lot of epidemiological studies have shown that childhood undernutrition is not due to food insecurity alone, that there are factors that operate within and across generations. Current therapies reduce mortality, but have had limited success in overcoming the long-term morbidities associated with undernutrition. And those include impaired linear growth or stunting, poor vaccine responses, neurodevelopmental delays. So we're missing something very profound about our understanding of pathogenesis. Now, undernutrition is defined by anthropometry. The anthropometric measures of wasting um, are expressed as a weight for length z-score. The World Health Organization has assembled a multinational cohort of healthy infants and children. The median values uh, for weight and for length or height um, have been computed for this reference cohort, and the number of standard deviations from that median value is used to express the degree of wasting. So the WLZ score, 
And uh, moderate acute malnutrition, or MAM, is defined as a WLZ score of minus two to minus three. Severe acute malnutrition, SAM, WLZ score worse than minus three. Currently, 40 million children around the planet have MAM. There is no accepted protocol for treating them. And again, after they are treated, they are left with these sequelae of impaired cognitive development, impaired immunity, disordered metabolism. 15 million children have SAM, severe acute malnutrition. And these children are treated with a protocol uh, involving ready-to-use therapeutic foods for um, several weeks, up to several months, until their anthropometry evolves so that they have MAM, moderate acute malnutrition. So they have post-SAM MAM. In all cases, again, children with wasting have this predilection to these physiologic perturbations that aren't affected by current therapy. And in no cases um, have there been effective therapies developed for impaired linear growth or stunting. So we need a much more comprehensive definition of the biological state or states associated with undernutrition. We need a keener view of the underlying pathobiology. We need new therapeutic targets. So I'm gonna take you on a multi-step journey that was alluded to in the initial comments uh, by Dr. Chisholm, which is defining normal in a population where the burden of disease is great developing metrics for quantifying deviations from normal and seeing whether there's an association, a significant association between disease incidence, disease severity, and deviations from normal, in this case, the microbiome. And then we have to identify whether perturbations in a microbiome are a cause or an effect of the disease. And then finally, identify therapeutic targets, develop therapeutic uh, leads, in relevant preclinical models and see whether we translate in randomized controlled clinical trials to humans. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna test a hypothesis together that there's a definable normal program of microbial community development and that there's a disruption in this developmental process as a underlying causal contribution to undernutrition. And we're also gonna think about this hypothesis in terms of its corollary, that healthy growth has to be conceptualized as a well-choreographed program of co-development of a microbial community and host organs and or organ subsystems. At least two orders of magnitude more genes are um, present in the microbiome. They encode functions that we've not to evolve in our own, on our own, and are not represented in our human genome. So how much of the functions of the microbiome uh, operate to shape systems physiology. So we'll define normal. We turned our attention together with Tamid Ahmed to an urban slum in Dhaka, Bangladesh, a birth cohort study, uh, the degree of community engagement by the healthcare providers at ICDDRB uh, has been extraordinary. The bonds of trust between the population and the healthcare providers enable longitudinal studies to be performed. In the case of the microbiome, the best control is the person herself or himself. So longitudinal studies are critical in this. And the birth cohort study began in the first month, monthly sampling of the fecal microbiota, monthly anthropometry, initially for 24 months and ultimately 60 months. So you imagine the degree of commitment on the part of the mothers living in this urban sun to understand uh, how their children's microbial community, which has to be explained to them in a way that they understand, is formed, and whether we can define among uh, children a normal program. The way normal or healthy is defined in this particular case is children who have consistently normal anthropometry. The actors that assemble on the stage the actors in this case being bacteria, bacterial taxa, are identified using culture-independent methods and a phylogenetic barcode of life, a gene that's present in all bacteria but whose sequence varies with different species. It's the 16S ribosomal RNA gene encoding the principal RNA in a small subunit of ribosomes. So PCR amplification of these genes in fecal samples collected monthly, uh, the identification of bacterial taxa, 
and those children have consistently normal anthropometry. And then the application of machine learning methods to identify the most age discriminatory organisms. We want to reduce the number of features that we have to look at to define normal. In this particular case, the output of an analysis using this 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon sequencing data set by machine learning performed by Satish Subramanian, an MD-PhD student in the lab, um, identified these age discriminatory organisms, bacterial taxa, that are portrayed as a heat map where each column in this particular heat map represents a monthly age bin beginning on the left with the first month and the right uh, 60 months and each row represents one of the age discriminatory strains. So you can see in the lower left in red organisms that are present in uh, greater abundance in early life and as, they, uh, as the rows turn to blue, these organisms become diminished in terms of their representation. In the middle of the uh, heat map, you'll see organisms that emerge as very dominant as the child ages and the microbiota matures. If we take a, um, if we take a, I'm gonna hope this works, if we take a slice through this heat map at a given monthly age bin, so at this particular month, we can look at the relative abundance of these age discriminatory strains and compute a stage of development or an age of the microbiota. It's a way of operationally defining the state of maturity of a microbiota. So everybody follow that. So we're going to advance our conceptualization since organisms in a microbial community don't operate in isolation, but rather collude and collaborate with one another and apply statistical techniques to these data sets to identify organisms that co-vary in their representation over time, as Arjun Raman did when he was a postdoc. We can identify a network of interacting organisms whose relative abundances change over time in a stereotypical way in healthy children living in this urban slum. And that group of organisms that co-vary was called an eco-group. And based on these analyses, identifying these discriminatory features of a microbial community as it matures, Arjun and others were able to determine this program of community assembly in healthy individuals is largely completed at the end of the second postnatal year. But in children who are undernourished, this program was impaired or arrested. So their microbiota looked younger than you would expect based on their chronological age. Current therapy, which was not designed with knowledge of or consideration of the developmental biology of the microbiota, did not repair this perturbed development. So these children are walking around with a developmental abnormality affecting the microbiota. Your question to yourself and to me, is that a cause or is that an effect? So we have to do a test of causality. We define normal in the way I've just described. There's a metric for quantifying deviations from normal, the representation of these eco-group taxa. Now we have to proceed to this test of causality. So these biospecimens are preserved um, using a protocol developed at ICTDRB so that within 10 to 15 minutes after their production by a child, they are placed at liquid nitrogen temperatures and maintained at least at minus 80 degrees uh, subsequently. So you're preserving microbial life in a moment in time. We can take microbial communities from children of a given chronological age who are either um, developing in a normal way as defined by anthropometry or have um, impaired growth, again, as defined by anthropometry. And for each donor, we plant their microbial communities in the intestines of mice that are raised under sterile condition so that the only organisms present in these organisms in their notobiotic isolators are the microbes from the donor. So we can take a given specimen and distribute it across multiple mice. We can take multiple specimens from individuals who have a particular growth phenotype, again, across multiple mice. And then we do the same thing for immature microbiota from children who are undernourished. And what was found with these sorts of tests of causality is that the immature microbiota of children with undernutrition transmitted impaired growth phenotypes impaired lean body mass gain, alterations in bone biology, alterations in immune function and metabolism. All the mice in all of the recipient groups are fed a diet representative of the population that we're sampling. So you can portray diet by microbiota interactions in this fashion. 
Now the stage is set after this test of causality to apply machine learning algorithms to identify organisms amongst all the animals whose representation correlates with different aspects of growth, lean body mass gain, bone biology, metabolism. We'll talk about those organisms among ourselves privately as growth discriminatory organisms. And these growth discriminatory organisms was, were identified using these preclinical models, which are designed to be representative of the population we ultimately want to treat. The diets of the population, the microbes of the population are all incorporated into these mouse models. So we identify these growth discriminatory strains. We have a set of aging growth discriminatory strains and look to see whether the representation of these growth discriminatory strains is similar in healthy children with normally developing microbiota or those who have impaired microbiota assembly. And it turns out that a number of these growth discriminatory strains are inappropriately represented, many underrepresented in the microbial communities of children who are undernourished. They became our therapeutic targets. And by the way, these organisms were cultured, their genomes were sequenced, and they were put together with an immature microbiota into a mouse, and the presence of these growth discriminatory strains uh, ameliorated the development of growth faltering in the mouse models. But we could not create a next generation probiotic consortium. First of all, most of these organisms hate oxygen. The manufacture of such a uh, consortium would be very difficult. The regulatory uh, pathway for approval would be complex. Plus, we could never um, scale in a way that we would have to in order to treat the vast number of children who are undernourished. So we're funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and one of the most important things to consider along the way in this multi-step journey is to think about therapeutic solutions that are going to be culturally acceptable, affordable, and scalable. So we turn to the foods that children eat. Every family in this world has to make a decision about what type of foods to begin to feed to their children when they stop exclusive milk feeding and go to a fully weaned state. This is a period known as the period of complementary feeding. And none of the policies related to complementary feeding are predicated on a consideration or knowledge of the developmental biology of the microbiota. The hypothesis is that certain complementary foods, which are available, culturally acceptable, and generally affordable, and may be scalable, contain nutrients that might be coveted by these inappropriately, and underperform, inappropriately represented and underperforming growth discriminatory strains. So a screen was done in our notobiotic mouse models of complementary foods being consumed by the population that we ultimately wanted to treat. And the hope was that we would find complementary foods that would affect the fitness and express beneficial functions of our therapeutic targets, that we would test these complementary foods initially singly, and then in combination, and ultimately come up with microbiota-directed complementary food prototype that could be used to repair the uh, microbial communities of these children. So the strategy is summarized here, um, uh, and I'll just try to describe this from the upper left portion uh, all the way across to the right portion of the uh, image. In the beginning, germ-free animals are colonized with a consortium of age and growth discriminatory strains of bacteria obtained from the population we want to treat. And we'll take these defined consortia and the mice uh, that harbor them and expose them to different complementary foods and get hits to determine whether we change the fitness and express beneficial functions of our targets. Um, we'll also think about if we do get hits from single ingredient screens, whether those foods have satisfactory organoleptic properties. How many people in this audience know what the term organoleptic means? Raise your hand, don't be afraid, you're being photographed. Okay, taste, texture, and smell. So if we make microbiota-directed complementary foods that are not satisfactory from an organoleptic perspective, they will be administered by the healthcare provider or mother to the child who will immediately eject the food into the lap of the healthcare provider, and therefore ameliorating the efficacy. So we have to think about those factors as well. The intersection between Food science, microbiome science, and nutritional science is really playing out in front of us. So we do such a screen, initially with single complementary foods, then combinations of complementary foods, and get leads. We then progress to a second stage screen, again conducted in mice, where now we don't have a defined consortia of cultured age and growth discriminatory strains whose genomes have been sequenced, but rather 
intact, uncultured microbial communities from children who presented with undernutrition were given standard therapy, but the microbiota, the microbial community, remains still in a state of disrepair. And the question is whether the leads from the defined community screens can repair the microbiota and intact community and hit the therapeutic targets. So we filter through that secondary screen and have um, formulations that work. We look at the effects on mouse physiology for those leads and then progress to a third step. We want to change the developmental biology of a human being. Do we trust the data we get in mice in terms of both efficacy and safety to go directly to a clinical trial? Or do we want to go to a second species whose physiology and metabolism is closer to that of humans? And the answer that we gave one another, yes. So we spent two years developing protocols that would reliably um, generate germ-free piglets and then we would colonize the piglets with the age and growth discriminatory strains that we talked about before and determine whether our microbiota directed complementary food leads, MDCS, would work in piglet models. And the answer was yes, and we progress now to a pre-proof of concept study in the very population whose microbes and diets were used to construct our preclinical models. Inhale, supplemental oxygen, we prepare for the next step in the journey. So, um, Remember the lingo, moderate acute malnutrition, MAM. These are children living in Mirpur, that urban slum. They're 12 to 18 months of age. They're defined as having MAM using anthropometry. Uh, a pilot study, 15 children per arm, three lead MDCS, microbiota-directed complementary foods, and a, a standard therapy, RUSF, ready-to-use supplementary foods, applied for four weeks. Um, with weekly sampling of the fecal microbiota. Just prior to initiation of therapy, a blood draw and the application of an aptamer-based technology developed by Somalogic so that we can measure the levels of 1,305 different plasma proteins that are both biomarkers and mediators of a whole host of physiological processes. We need a more comp comprehensive definition of the biological state or states of children with undernutrition. We also want to go to class. We want to be able to use the opportunity of repairing a microbiota to com com connect dots. If we repair a microbiota, we can potentially compare changes in the components of a microbiota with the operations of different physiological systems or systems to be able to determine how the microbiota might manipulate host biology. So we do the blood draw prior to treatment, and we do the blood draw at the end of this four-week period of treatment. We knew that this study was underpowered. We wouldn't get a statistically significant change in anthropometric measures of growth, but perhaps we could see a change in microbiota, and we would define repair by changes in the representation of those eco-group taxa, and we would define changes in host physiology using these 1,305 proteins that were mediators or uh, biomarkers of different aspects of physiology. And after doing this, we had some winners. We had a winner, which was actually the most um, effective treatment in our preclinical models, which we unimaginably called MDCF2, Microbiota Directed Complementary Food Prototype 2, and we had the standard of care of RUSF. This is a nutritionist view of a therapeutic food. Chickpea flour, soybean flour, peanut flour, green banana, a source of lipids, um, in this case soybean oil, a micronutrient premix, protein, fat, and carbohydrate content. You'll see that the complementary foods in MDCF2 are as listed. You'll see that none of them are represented in RUSF, which consists primarily of rice and lentil, and also powdered milk, and that the caloric density of RUSF is 15% greater than that of MDCF2. So we're proposing to promote the pondral growth of children with MAM using a lead therapeutic that has lower caloric density. We're saying to ourselves that it's not just calories, it's the biotransformation of foods and also the reconfiguration of a microbiota that may be instrumental in driving the growth of children. So here's the um, randomized control study design. We're still in Mirpur. We're still dealing with children who are 12 to 18 months of age. 
these children have MAM as defined by anthropometry. But now the study is three months long, again, as before, with the pre-POC twice daily uh, feeding with these uh, formulations, serial collection of fecal samples prior to, during, and one month after treatment, blood draws at time zero, one month at the end of the intervention period. Now the capacity to look at, in 100 microliters of blood, 5,000 different proteins, so get a more comprehensive definition of the physiologic state or states of these children. The primary outcome measure is gonna be a change in anthropometry, weight for length z-score. The secondary outcome measures are gonna be microbiota repair and the plasma proteome, and changes in the plasma proteome towards a healthier state. Pause, a strategic thought. Um, we don't know the time course of evolution of changes in ponderal growth, weight gain, would be the same as changes in linear growth, nor do we know whether the effects on neural development will follow the same time course. So perhaps it would be wise, we said to ourselves, to follow these children for two years after cessation of treatment to determine not only the durability of the effects of a three-month intervention as it relates to ponderal growth, but whether other aspects of physiology become uh, significantly improved. Well, that was the organization of the trial. And the first observation was, even though the caloric density of MDCF2 is 15% lower than that of RUSF, there was a more rapid increase in weight for length z-score in those treated with the microbiota-directed formulation. So why should this be? There was not, by the way, a significant difference in LA z-scores, length for age z-score, so between the two treatment group at the end of the three-month period. We're gonna give you a teaser and say that may not be true during the subsequent two years of follow-up. And I'll give you data about that in a second. Okay, we have uh, 60 children per arm, 120 children, and we can take each one of these 5,000 different proteins and determine whether there's a significant correlation between their levels and WLZ score. We can identify a series of uh, proteins that are positively correlated, significantly positively correlated with WLZ. We could also identify proteins that were significantly negatively correlated. Those that were, in this particular trial, performed in children with MAM, significantly positively correlated with WLZ, were involved in mediating uh, musculoskeletal development, brain development, certain aspects of metabolism. Those that were significantly negatively correlated with WLZ were largely comprised of biomarkers and mediators of inflammation. When we compare the effects of MDCF2 versus RUSF on these um, proteins, positively and negatively correlated with WLZ, those that were positively correlated increased to a significantly greater degree with MDCF2 compared to RUSF. Those that were negatively correlated decreased significantly more. So the first hint that um, uh, this MDCF2 operated beyond the walls of the gut to uh, influence mediators of different aspects of physiology. During the two-year follow-up, we see a significant difference in linear growth. In children living in these areas of the world, LAZ uh, typically progressively decreases in terms of its uh, 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 score compared to the healthy controls. Uh, but the degree of decrease is significantly less with MDCF2 compared to RUSF. So we see an effect on linear growth manifest uh, after cessation of treatment. We also saw a preview of the fact that uh, musculoskeletal development was being affected because we saw these changes in mediators of musculoskeletal development during the intervention period, the three-month intervention period. Let's look at structure activity relationships. What are the key targets, the first responders to MDCF2? What do their genomes encode? What uh, pathways, either signaling or metabolic pathways, do they express in response to treatment to M with MDCF2 versus RUSF? So deep shotgun sequencing uh, is cheaper now. Um, and uh, for each child in this trial, both arms, we had at least eight well-preserved uh, fecal samples during the course 
of the trial. Or initial sampling at the time of initiation of treatment, during treatment, and after treatment. So for each child, shotgun sequencing data sets were generated from these multiply or serially collected fecal samples, and algorithms currently exist, have been developed, to assemble those shotgun reads into genomes. And those assembled genomes are called MAGs, metagenome assembled genomes. So we could look uh, and identify, in principle, those bacterial strains, representative mags, whose abundances, representation, were affected by treatment with MDCF2 versus RUSF, but more importantly, ask what genes are differentially expressed, what functions do they encode, and how that might be related to the bioactive components of MDCF2. Okay, I'm going to go through the answers in a second to those types of questions. First of all, we were able to assemble, um, Matt Hibbard led the charge, 1,000 high-quality mags. For each child, a set of mags was assembled, each child in both treatment arms, and then we would dereplicate that set of mags. So you have a set of mags that were shared across individuals, 1,000 high-quality mags, and which of these mags um, showed significant positive associations, which of these mags whose abundances we could quantify were significantly positively correlated with WLZ. There were 75 of them. And in their genomes, we saw an enrichment of metabolic pathways involved in carbohydrate metabolism. The first hint that carbohydrates may be key bioactive components of MDCF2. But again, that's a static view. And there's a certain medieval aspect to microbiome research where a lot of the work is focused on DNA. Of course, knowing a genome doesn't tell you how that genome operates. You can predict functions, but you want to actually see express function. So the annotation of these genomes, these mags, done using a scheme developed by our collaborators, Andre Osterman and Dmitry Rodion, and it's called MCSEED. So these metabolic reconstructions involve 106 different pathways, and we look at the representation of those pathways across all mags and see whether these positively correlated mags have an enrichment in certain pathways. And again, as I said, their focus, the enrichment is focused on carbohydrate metabolism. There's a revolution occurring in food science with mass spectrometry. The naturally occurring chemical landscape of different cultivars of food can be defined. Uh, so we can think about food not in terms of labels, but think about food from the perspective of the microbes. They don't see the labels, they see molecular components that they could use as substrate. So our longstanding collaborator, um, Carlito Labrilla, has assembled encyclopedias of the carbohydrate landscape of different food staples around the world. We analyzed the components of MDCF2 in isolation and as a mixture in MDCF2, the same thing for RUSF, and found polysaccharides whose representation was significantly different in MDCF2 compared to RUSF. I know that most people have glycophobia rather than glycophilia, a fear of carbohydrate uh, biochemistry uh, rather than the love of it. I'm not going to go through the structures right now because we don't have enough time, and uh, the uh, uh, dean of this medical school has a taser, which he says he will operate if I go too far over in time. Uh, so I'm going to quickly switch to um, the following summary slide. We can look at uh, gene expression by performing microbial RNA-seq. RNA is well preserved in these fecal samples because I, I had mentioned to you they're all put at cryogenic temperatures within 10 to 15 minutes after they're produced by the child. We can look at DNA, we can look at RNA, and we can look at metabolites. So uh, on the right, um, some key findings from microbial RNA-seq of these serially collected fecal samples from children in the MDCF2 versus RUSR. RUSF arm. Um, the WLZ response can be correlated with expression of genes in carbohydrate utilization pathways, and that the levels of um, the microbial products of MDCF2 glycan degradation, defined by mass spectrometry of glycans isolated from feces, all can point to the bioactive components of MDCF2. So we identify the polysaccharide structures in MDCF2 that seem to be the key drivers of um, um, the response. Um, 
And in addition, we see that most of the transcriptional responses, um, at least of carbohydrate utilization pathways, originate from two strains of Prevotella capri that are present in these children's microbial community. There are multiple strains of Prevotella capri in their communities, but two strains have an assemblage of genome features called polysaccharide utilization loci um, that encode the enzymes that are necessary for the breakdown of different polysaccharides. So imagine a genome where there are these clusters of genes encoding carbohydrate active enzymes that can break down polysaccharide. Each cluster is dedicated to a particular type of polysaccharide. Each cluster is controlled by transcription factors. These clusters are differentially expressed. In the case of the microbiota directed complementary foods, the organisms that seem most responsive to their administration are two strains of P. copri that can be described by two mags, mag 18 and 19. And the polysaccharide utilization loci that they shared are portrayed as green. So if you look at mag 19 and 19 and 18, you can see that there are a series of polysaccharide utilization loci. The yellow indicates loci that aren't absolutely conserved structurally, but they're conserved functionally. And you can see that each of these pools appear to be dedicated to a particular type of polysaccharide utilization. And these polysaccharides are the ones that are differentially represented in MDCF2 compared to RUSF. So you're able to, in this manner, identify the first responders to MDCF2, which bacterial strains, very selective, and as well as what the bioactive components are. So with knowledge of that, DNA-based analysis, RNA-based analysis, mass spec-based analysis, we could go back to the well-preserved fecal samples from the study population in culture the strains that correspond to these mags. And that's a very powerful approach um, to be able to identify and further characterize the properties of these targets of um, MDCF2 treatment. And then we can utilize the cultured strains to do in vitro experiments. We do in vitro experiments by taking these strains and exposing them to the polysaccharides that we think are the bioactive components and looking at the growth of these strains. This is very important in the future to identify prebiotics. We may not want to give diets. It's hard to formulate a diet that's shelf stable and distributed around the world. The ultimate dream is to have prebiotic sprinkles that represent collections of these bioactive polysaccharides that you can add to a particular dietary matrix. So we want to identify and test in this fashion, at least in vitro, what we think are the bioactive components. They can be tested singly and in combination against what we think are the target strains. We can look at different strains to see their responsiveness. We can then do reverse translation experiments. So we've gone all the way up to a randomized controlled clinical trial. We've characterized the response of the children, both in terms of anthropometry as well as in terms of their proteome. Um, we have a better idea of how the MDCF2 affects this aspect of physiology, linear growth or um, ponderal growth and some of the effectors. But we really want to make sure that we do direct tests to determine whether these types of strains that we've identified in this fashion are the direct legislature of uh, physiologic response. So the reverse translation experiments involve using the mags to get the corresponding strains from the study population, sequence the genomes of the cultured strains, and then add as consortia these organisms, age and growth discriminatory with sequenced genome, to female mice, germ-free mice that have just delivered a litter of pups. So there'll be a series of gavages of these mice. First, a consortium that represents early colonizers in healthy children. Then another gavage a little bit later that represents an intermediate stage of colonization, so later colonizers. And then a third gavage, still later colonizers. So that since the mother receives these uh, organisms and transmits them to her pups, you're able to reenact in the pups the normal sequence of assembly of microbial community. 
focusing on age and growth discriminatory strains. So this is done in two groups of animals. One in which the sequence of gavage includes P. copri, the P. copri strains that we think are the target. Another group of animals gets all the other organisms except for P. copri. And we can compare and contrast the biological responses of mice harboring these two different consortia, with and without P. copri, um, to MDCF2. And the findings are that compared to mice that lack P. copri, the ones that uh, have it exhibit significantly greater weight gain in this reverse translation, uh, uh, translation experiment, markedly greater processing of MDCF2 glycans, and marked effects on energy metabolism in the gut epithelium. And the spatial patterns, for those who are interested in spatial transcriptomics and metabolomics, the spatial patterns of response to P. copri in the context of MDCF2 is restricted to particular areas along the cryptilis axis, with the greatest response occurring to, in enterocytes that are positioned at the base in the mid-portion of villi. It is quite uh, interesting. Okay, this idea of looking at gene expression um, in response to treatment in a clinical population can be very informative for the prebiotic discovery pipeline. So if you look at other positively WLZ associated taxa spanning different genera than Prevotella that encode carbohydrate utilization pathways in pools, um, you see that one of the responses uh, to MDCF2 involves pectins um, and um, complementary foods um, enriched in pectins may target additional growth discriminatory strains and growth promoting strains than uh, um, would be possible with some of the glycans that are currently represented in MDCF2. This is a complicated slide. These are the different components of pectin, the different pathways that um, are shown in our microbial RNA-seq of fecal samples to be enriched in terms of their expression correspond to different components of pectin. So I'm going to start wrapping up and appreciate uh, the attention you've given me so far. I'd like you to consider a bunch of things. First of all, the need to determine the generalizability of this approach, its durability and its long-term safety. So you have to test in other populations. You have to think about age as a variable. Remember, the hypothesis is co-development of the microbiota and host systems and subsystem is key to healthy growth. So with um, treatment with MDCF2 in a six-month-old, have the same effects as treatment at 24 months. How malleable is the system? Uh, what is the biological state or states at the time of clinical presentation? Does the duration severity of disruptive community development affect responsiveness to initiation of treatment? So how long before treatment is initiated has the community been disrupted and how severely disrupted has that community been? How about the age in which the disruption has occurred? Is that gonna influence? So is disruption in a young child um, going to have a greater effect size um, on uh, growth than disruption at later life. Um, so we're going to have to determine that, and that's going to require an analysis over a broader age range in 12 to 18 months in different countries, and also the importance of doing these studies uh, over a broad age range for a given study, that is to say um, 6 to 24 months, but also have at least a two-year follow-up to determine whether the evolution of pondral growth changes and um, linear growth changes or even neurodevelopmental changes is influenced um, by prior treatment with MDCF2. So very briefly, uh, this week uh, a paper will appear in Science Translational Medicine. Remember I said children with SAM are treated with RUTFs um, or other types of therapeutic approaches and are often left in a state of BAM. So, uh, treatment um, begins, but is terminated before full repair of a microbiota. The question is, when they are in a state of post-SAM-MAM, whether the application of MDCF2 will produce an improved pondral and linear growth response. So that study was done. It's going to be described in this article. It's done at two sites, an urban site, Dhaka, and uh, a rural site in Bangladesh, Kurigram. Same sort of study design. Um, uh, an initial three-month intervention, and then we have follow-up. And the results were similar than what we saw with children who didn't have an antecedent history of SAM, had primary MAM. 
Um, and that was encouraging to us because ultimately we might think about treatment with microbiota directed foods as involving a same formulation applied to children with MAM and SAM, um, MAM or SAM, but at different doses or different duration. If you aggregate the proteomic responses of both clinical studies, you can identify shared proteomic responses, um, including proteins that are associated with LAZ responses. And this is a quick sampling of the types of, of um, proteins that we see changing in response to the intervention. Uh, proteins involved in bone mineralization, ECA, uh, extra, uh, 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 cellular matrix uh, formation, uh, matrix remodeling. Um, there's a, a series of genes um, that encode proteins whose plasma level changes that are involved in energy metabolism. A few of the examples of IGF-1, um, the binding protein for IGF-1 that helps deliver it to sites. Um, a negatively correlated protein, GDNF-15, um, is a regulator of appetite. It suppresses appetite. Um, it was reduced. Um, and you can see this uh, whole series of proteins that are involved in different aspects of synaptic transmission and plasticity, neuronal development and axon guidance, um, neurotrophic signaling and survival. Why is it that stunting is associated with neurodevelopmental delays? Are these sorts of results indicating a role for the microbiome in not only influencing linear growth, but coincidentally influencing neurodevelopment. We're looking at a study that's underway in five different countries of the effect of MDCF2 compared to locally produced um, uh, foods as well as RUSF. Um, these countries include Bangladesh, India, Mali, Pakistan, and Tanzania. It's a three-month intervention with a three-month follow-up. And we're trying to take a broader age range, six to 24 months. And children with MAM, but may have complications associated with MAM, including diarrheal diseases or antecedent pneumonia. And we're doing mechanistic sub-studies of the type that I described. The return on investment in this sort of study, uh, which is called Nutramam, sponsored by the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, and UNICEF, would be to determine the generalizability of uh, this approach to treating undernutrition and the identification of biomarkers for stratification of disease population and better evaluation of efficacy. Hopefully, we will get to the point where we can do adaptive clinical studies. In addition, a more comprehensive definition of wellness for infants and children with point of care diagnostics, as well as evolution of policies about complementary feeding that are in part predicated on knowledge of the developmental biology of the microbiota. And in my last slide, the importance of thinking about the intergenerational transmission of the microbiota. Um, undernutrition is an intergenerational problem. Mothers who are undernourished will often give birth to children who have intrauterine growth restriction, are uh, small for gestational age. Um, and one of the questions uh, is, uh, what is the state of the maternal microbiota, and can we affect the configuration of the microbiota of the mothers so that when transmitted to children, produce healthy growth, or um, repair the microbiota of these mothers so that interuterine growth is uh, uh, improved. And I'll just end by telling you that there is an entity called environmental enteric dysfunction that was first identified in Peace Corps workers uh, coming back from areas of high fecal oral contamination. These uh, Peace Corps workers had lost their villi, or had shortened villi. The epithelium was disrupted, so barrier function was perturbed. They had a chronic inflammatory infiltrate in the lamina propria of the gut. They had not only local inflammation, but systemic inflammation. And these Peace Corps workers would generally um, uh, be treated with a variety of different protocols, no common protocols, and their villi would return to normal. The question is, is this enteropathy present in children with undernutrition? and also in the mothers. So we've uh, been part, together with the ICDDRB, of unprecedented studies of doing endoscopy in children who fail standard nutritional intervention and find that, lo and behold, they have this um, patho, uh, pathologic response in their small intestines. Um, mothers uh, who are undernourished, living in the same area, have this EED. We have cultured organisms uh, from these children and their mothers 
in this, from the small intestine because aspirates can obtain with endoscopy. And when these consortia of cultured organisms from donors with EED, um, and also in the case of mothers, healthy mothers are introduced into mice through intergenerational transmission. The germ-free mothers are colonized and they become pregnant and they transmit these consortia to their offspring. That um, mothers who are undernourished, children who have undernutrition, will have small intestinal microbiota that can transmit this enteropathy and systemic inflammation. So think about the microbiota, not just in terms of the fecal microbiota, but the entire length of the small intestine and the complex biogeographical features of that community and its operation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for this wonderful uh, uh, endorsement of the field of microbiome research. And think about the intersection between food food science, microbiome science, and human nutrition at this time when feeding one another healthy foods is going to be so uh, important but so challenging in the face of climate change and all the geopolitical disruptions that are occurring. Bon appetit.